without the people of the BSI and the people of their ilk, this country wouldn't have existed. There's no memorial to these people who worked at the BSI. All that stands now is a wreck. That's a disgrace. The origins of BSA go back really quite a long time. Um, Birmingham had been a town that had achieved some kind of preeminence in the metal bashing trades in late medieval times. And that tradition fed into the development of a gun making industry. The company uh, originally was formed by a number of gunsmiths who worked in and around Birmingham. At that time, gunsmiths usually made a particular part, i.e. there'd be a company making barrels, another company making the actions, another company making stocks, and somebody putting them together. One of the pressures upon the industry was the development of mechanisation. Uh, the Enfield factory in London was one of the prime instigators of, of, of uh, mass production techniques and mechanisation in Britain. The big pressure point seems to have arisen at the time of the Crimean War. Pressure upon the industry was so great that it was very, very difficult for the small arms manufacturers, the individual workshops, to meet the demand that was placed upon, upon them. So these group of gunsmiths got together uh, and formed an association whereby they uh, were to introduce um, mass production methods and they established themselves on this site in Small Heath. They did fall into hard times in between wars etc uh, and then started to diversify into other products. Uh, one of which he initially started with was the uh, cycle. So they made bicycle components and because of the high standard of skill in gun making, they passed this on to the cycle trade, which made them the, the Rolls Royce of the world. Similarly, um, at a later date, there was the production of motorcycles as, as the BSA began to mechanise in, in, in different directions. And then the cyclical demands for war put pressure upon the company at particular times, uh, whether we're talking about colonial wars or the Boer War or the First World War. War. Precisely at dawn on September 1st, without warning, the German Wehrmacht ruled over the Polish border. BSA during the war were the main munition people uh, in this country and the, they'd been warned about it, in, uh, the government had been warned about it when uh, St James Lee in 1936 went to uh, Germany and saw the actual Germans producing and saying that the bullets they were preparing were for the England. Hitler had his equipment. He had his arm. Now to unveil the German might and terrorize his victims into submission. He said it's not enough, it's going to be a war. And on his own bat, he multiplied the figures that the government wanted by his figures. And it's because of that that, in fact, when the Battle of Britain started, BSA were able to produce enough Browning guns for the new Spitfires. So, is one of those people, without his foresight, we might have lost the war. Of course, during the war years, uh, on this site, they manufactured a huge number of armaments of all sorts. The Browning machine guns, which were fitted into Spitfires and uh, other fighting aircraft, Bofors, Bofors guns, uh, Sten guns by the million, uh, rocket launchers, huge uh, amounts of ammunition and fuses for shells of all sorts. So uh, as far as the war effort was concerned, they produced 
many, many uh, armaments of all descriptions. Obviously the BSI was probably the biggest manufacturer of, uh, of guns during the war, um, but not only guns, they made bikes, uh, military vehicles, everything from barbed wire upwards really, so anything to actually do with the war effort, the BSI made it. This is a folding bicycle made by BSA for parachute troopers in the Second World War, hence commonly referred to as a para-bike. It folds in the middle by undoing these two butterfly nuts, pushing the pedals through, and folds like that. And the parachutist would exit the plane with this hanging on a rope. When he hit the ground, the, ideally the bike would hit first, he'd unfold it and pedal away on it. Oh, I can give you all the figures there, I've got all the figures there, yeah. of how many, how many uh, Browning guns, how many anti-tanks, how many Sten guns, how many Enfield rifles were made, I've got all those figures. Oh, it's unbelievable, the, the hundreds of thousands of millions. It was the Orlikan as well, wasn't it? Pardon? The Orlikan gun. The Orlikan yeah. gun, yes, oh yes. That they, was a Swiss paint it, dotting. It's quite amazing, you know, the figures are there, but the, their, their contribution to the, sport, to the war in the way of supplying munitions for the country goes, uh, you know, uh, it, well, it has to be recognised because they were the most formidable uh, company in the, in the country. ICI and people like that, but BSA really took it on board and they developed all these subsidiary firms, these uh, dispersal units or whatever they call them, and they were, they were producing so much, so much for the war. Unbelievable. So, you know, as a company, they were a great asset, asset to the country during the war. In June 1940, when the British and French armies were evacuated from Dunkirk, the BSI went on a 24 hour a day shift system. A normal working week during the war would probably be about 49 hours, but the man that I learnt my trades from, a man named Jimmy Heath, he actually got 103 actual hours of work in, in a week, but we were all doing the same thing, you just had to work. Many people worked at the BSI, including many women. The women were rather wonderful in the Second World War, they had families to look after, and yet they volunteered to work days, nights, any time you like. <clears throat> when I got to 21, they called me up again, and I had to go in the factory. So I went to the BSA, and I was working from 7 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock at night. I was put on a eight min milling machines, and I was doing trigger guards. It started with a steel block in the first and as one program went I had to keep doing it till I got to the end. It was real hard work. Did you go to any dances in the lunch break? Oh yes, I used to dance in the dinner time. Well I, you had to, to keep your morale going, you know. And then at night they used to have perhaps a variety show or something like that. Or if any of the uh, Workers had got any talent, they'd get up on the stage and sing and, and play the piano or anything like that, you know. And as I say, they, it, we made our own fun. Mm. We got on... Um, it, actually, I, I say we had made our own happiness, because we had to, because otherwise you could get really down, because that's all you did was work. Nineteenth, just after nine o'clock, there was a massive raid on Birmingham. The sirens went very early, and when the bombers was coming, they'd, they'd all got a distinctive drone with them, a distinctive buzz, boom, 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 different to any other plane. And we heard it many times because they flew over Birmingham. You see, and they, the, you could see the markings on the wings from in our garden, and of course. You realise afterwards that the canal ran only about a quarter of a mile from where our house was, and they could follow the canal to the BSA, which run by the side of the BSA. Obviously, you know, due to the BSA making so many ammunitions, and, and it was quite an influential place during the war, it was the place to bomb. They sort of went 
They seemed to go past it at one period. When it first, and then they come, they must have gone round in a circle and then they come back and started coming in low. And one aircraft delivered two bombs straight into the BSA and it hit one of the modern factory blocks. They were told not to go and shelter in the basement, but they got a brick built shelter over the other side of the canal in the recreation. So, but a lot of people, it was too far to run, they got to run across the canal, you know, and it was exposed. Um, they used to go down in the basement. And others would then just carry on working when the bombing was on, if they could, because it was all blacked out, the lights, uh, the place. And um, you see what happened when they eat the, I think it was F block, and eat the corner of the, the building. All the heavy machine in the auto section went straight through the floors, down into the basement. Night raids over Britain have lately increased. Birmingham has been one of the enemy's targets. Damage was done and lives lost. The same is true of other places in the Midlands and also in the eastern counties. Well, two more ride to work every day on the bike. On that particular morning, it meant that I was climbing over bomb craters or over rubble or houses burning. The whole two miles of work was pretty chaotic but the chaos was nothing to what was greeting me when I arrived at BSA on that particular morning. I went in on my bicycle and I was allowed in because being an electrician on maintenance as well. And I actually had to go into the rubble with the rescue people and we were moving rubble and if we saw an arm or a leg, we called the Red Cross people and they pushed us on one side and they reclaimed the body. The Home Guard done hell of a lot as far as uh, firefighting was concerned. Um, I mean, they played a big part at the, at the BSI, because the, the BSI had a, quite a big unit. So a lot of the factories had their own Home Guard unit and fire service unit. But on that same night, two of the electricians who I worked with, very close friends of mine, the one went into the uh, wreckage with an acetylene cutter and was cutting girders and managed to save the lives of a number of people. And he got the George Medal, a fellow named Alf Stevens, and Al, uh, Alf Goodwin helped him and he had the Empire, British Empire Medal. And it was amazing, the whole thing. Amazing how much work that was put in by people. And, well, you know, the fire people and everybody. Some of the mem memorabilia that I've got about the BSI, I've read it through again this morning. <coughs> and there was one piece I read through, I actually cried because um, the, uh, the man himself got bombed in the BSA and it, it looked as if he wouldn't recover, it wouldn't get out. And this Alf uh, Stevens got him out. And the guy, all he was thinking was getting home, but they wanted to take him to the hospital. He said, my wife will get me right, never mind. They got him home and his home had been bombed. And he, he goes in to try and find his wife, and his wife's not there, but she was next door, fortunately, and they heard him. But, uh, ooh. Well, it's a, a very human story, you see. Well, I think it was um, the biggest loss of life at any factory, mm. um, the BSI. 53 people lost their lives there, many of them women. Uh, 89 uh, workers were injured and 53 were killed. Uh, it took six weeks to get the last body out of the factory. So it was quite a disaster, a disaster as uh, an air raid disaster and a disaster for Birmingham. Late 40s when I started school, it was all swept under the carpet. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It had been a horrible period. I think that people wanted to forget uh, in some ways and I think that's probably not actually done the, the city a many favours because I think we've, the, the city's lost a great deal. The youngsters that we get round here are not aware of what the Blitz was, what the BSA was, what the area is now, what it was used for. 
it's just open space that, that means nothing to them. Well, I don't think it's remembered really. It's forgotten. It's remembered by enthusiasts who have motorcycles. If they think of the BSA, the only thing they're going to think about the BSA is bikes and motorcycles. They're not going to think about the, the magnificent effort that they made during the world as I stated previously. Well, I think it's been completely forgotten in terms of its war effort, yes. According to the historians, Birmingham was the second heaviest bombed city outside of London. And for some reason, probably during the war because of censorship, the people in the rest of the country were unaware of the bashing that Birmingham got here in the Second World War. Uh, not many people are aware that at the outbreak of war, there was a D-notice placed on most of the major cities who dealt with munitions and all to do with armaments during the war, which obviously Birmingham came under this umbrella because of the number of factories here involved in war work. The D-notice was a 30-year ban, with the result that when Birmingham was bombed in the early days, it was never ever mentioned. It was always referred to as a Midlands town. The papers were censored because the Germans uh, would have their informants and um, we were supposed to be keeping it from them, but they knew what they were doing and they knew what they were bombing. But the rest of the rest of the country didn't. Kampfflugzeuge von Typ U88 werden zum Start klar gemacht. Birmingham, eines der Industriezentren Mittelenglands, soll mit starken Kräften angegriffen werden. After the war, when it all came out, there was still this ban on Birmingham, and so with the result, we are not in the history books, and it's so unfair when we are not mentioned, and you get people in Birmingham, even they say. Oh, I know Coventry was bombed. Was Birmingham bombed? A thousand fold revenge was Coventry. On the night of November 14th, a million pounds of bombs were dropped on the city. Well, I, I always get a little bit annoyed about that because um, when they start talking about the Blitz, they always talk about Coventry. It's always Coventry, all right. It, it had a lot of devastation there, and, and a lot of it was all done in one night. But for many years after the war, you walked around Birmingham, and there was hell of a lot of places missing. There were nearly a thousand casualties, nearly a thousand more people killed in Birmingham than Coventry. And we had the twice the tonnage of high explosive bombs dropped on this city, and. Um, it's not recorded, or there's no publicity about it. The cathedral in, in Coventry was bombed and stuff like that, so it may be remembered more for, for the bombing of the cathedral and, and the surrounding area as opposed to them trying to bomb the BSA here. You know, perhaps it's almost, you know, a gun factory in the middle of Birmingham. Perhaps they're, perhaps they're almost expected to have it bombed type of thing during the war. That's the thing that, you know, Hitler and his planes and <laughs> tried to do. Um, as opposed to bombing innocent people or a cathedral. So. Uh, my name is John Price. I run the Made in Birmingham website. I run the campaign for the BSA memorial, trying to uh, get a memorial for the workers that were killed in 1940. It is supported by the local MP, Roger Godsiff. Well, I understand that there is a campaign for um, a permanent memorial to BSA, and it's one that I support. I think it, um, as I say, it, it's a very prominent part of the area, of the Small Heath area. Um, it, um, it's a very important part of the history of Birmingham. And um, the people who were killed uh, by the bombing at the factory were making just as much of a contribution to the war effort as the uh, troops on the front line. So um, I think it's right and proper that the people who, uh, who were killed um, should have a memorial and I support the campaign to um, have one. But the boundaries have changed in uh, 2004 and now uh, uh, John Hemming is a local MP and he doesn't seem to support it in the same way as Roger Godsiff does. Quite a few people died during the, the, the bombings of Birmingham, there were just over 2,000 for which we've recently created a memorial in the centre of Birmingham. There was quite a lot of effort that went into commemorating everybody who died in Birmingham as a result of the bombings, which includes the 53 people from BSA. 
if it, if it wasn't for the fact that we'd already just had a memorial um, to the people who died from the bombings in the city, it'd be a much stronger case because there wouldn't be a memorial at all. But there is one. And you therefore ask yourself a question of, do we need another memorial when we've got a memorial? And if we have that, do we then, for equity reasons, we should do it for everybody else? It depends on what type of memorial you want and how significant you want the memorial to be. And I suggest the number of people killed and the way they were killed. Remember, these people were making weapons for war. Some of them were too young to go to war and some of them were too old to be at war. So it, I think the significance of the event should be uh, celebrated by the significance of the memorial. The fact of the matter is, as John Hemmings has pointed out previously um, to you, uh, the people who were killed in the bombing of Birmingham have been, uh, are going to be rightly remembered by the memorial in the city centre. But the, uh, the whole point about the BSA um, is the BSA was a huge part of, of Birmingham's industrial history and its heritage. And it was a factory that was working on war production when these people were killed. And it played a, a very important role in the war effort. When you remember that Birmingham erected a memorial to the Spitfire at Castle Vale, I mean, the Spitfire was only used in a very small campaign during the Second World War. But, um, and the Spitfire would have been an, uh, an ornament without BSA guns on it. So, I mean, BSA contributed to, uh, to both wars. And in fact, it produced most of the weapons that were actually made in both world wars. So again, that's a very significant fact. And if you can put a memorial up to Spitfire workers and the Spitfire at Castle Bromwich, surely you can put one up to BSA. Uh, they, of course, did do a memorial relating to all the people that died during the bombing of Birmingham as a whole. Uh, but I think that uh, as the BSA was had such a huge impact on the uh, on the production of armaments during the war. It, it was a hugely important site, and uh, people literally died serving the country, producing these items, and, and as such, they should be commemorated, and and certainly as close as possible to the site where it happened. We carry on with the uh, appeal and we hope by the year uh, 2010, which will be the 70th anniversary of the air raid, that we will in fact have some form of a memorial on site. What you do, take the cover off, and put the barrels in, and the drills come all the way through. The gentleman is building the um, magazines for the Super 10, the Ultra Multi Shot. The BSA meet you today.